A sad tale's best for winter. I have one of spirits and goblins. William Shakespeare, The Winter's Tale. I fear not the dark itself, but what may lurk within it. Welcome to Lurk, bringing you creepy, strange, and bone-chilling stories with your host, Jamie Jackson. Lurkers, welcome to episode 38. For those of you who celebrate the Christmas holiday, Merry Christmas Eve. I hope everyone has or had a fantastic celebration of whatever holiday it is that you celebrate. As promised, today's episode is all about ghost stories, which is, of course, my favorite subject. But you might wonder what the heck Christmas has to do with ghost stories in the first place other than that line in the song, The Most Wonderful Time of the Year, that says, there will be scary ghost stories, or the classic movie A Christmas Carol and its ghosts. The tradition of telling ghost stories at Christmas predates Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and even Shakespeare himself. Back before Christianity took hold, people of the world celebrated pagan holidays. During the winter, on the longest night of the year, which is December 21st, It was believed that the veil between worlds was thin, and it was a time that signified life and death. Then, when Christianity began spreading, it also began incorporating the pagan traditions into the Christian holidays. Of course, Charles Dickens really got things going with his tale of the Christmas Carol, and the ghost of old Jacob Marley and Christmas past, present, and future. Even the Christmas movie It's a Wonderful Life has its own strange paranormal occurrences. In my family, sharing ghost stories was something that happened at nearly every large gathering, but most especially at Christmas. Maybe it was because so many of us were together at that holiday, or maybe because of the weather we were all kept inside, but whatever the reason, Christmas always seemed the time that we really told ghost stories. I remember spending time with my cousin, enthralled, listening to the stories told by the adults. Some were made up, but many included true life encounters of the paranormal. I can point to this and say, this here is where my love of the paranormal and the love of family history began. So get comfortable, make yourself a cup of hot tea, snuggle under a blanket in front of the fireplace, or at least imagine doing that, and get ready for some spooky stories. I'm going to get started here with something short that happened just this past weekend. Every year at Christmas, we make a trip to the cemetery to put wreaths on my grandparents' and great-grandparents' graves. This year, the group consisted of my parents, myself, my son and daughter, and my two grandsons. The youngest grandson is two, and while everybody was putting the wreaths out, he starts playing peekaboo. Seems innocent enough, right? Except he was playing peekaboo with his back to us, the actual physical people in the area and was playing with someone that wasn't there, or at least that we couldn't see. Later that evening at dinner, we asked him who he was playing peekaboo with earlier, and his response was simply, the man and Beulah. I have no idea who Beulah is. Next time I go to the cemetery, I do plan on checking out the headstones to see if there might be a Beulah nearby, and I can assure you we do not have anybody living or dead in our family that had the first name Beulah. Really, this isn't anything terribly new or shocking in our family. In my experience, all kids have the ability to see things until they get older and learn not to see them anymore. But all this talk about the peekaboo phantom game led to a conversation with my dad about his experiences in a home located near his grandparents' farm. Now, I've heard these stories before but I wanted him to tell them again so that they were fresh in my mind and I could share them with you. I'm going to refer to my dad's grandparents as Nan and Pop, since that's what they were called, at least by me. Nan and Pop owned a farm, and near the barn was a house where an elderly couple by the last name of Shipley lived. Pop used to pump the water from his well up to a water holding tank at the Shipley's house, back before there was city water available. 
After the Shipleys had both passed away, my dad and Pop went to the house to begin cleaning it out. The first trip there, they entered the house, and the door immediately slammed shut behind them. Another time, my dad was upstairs when he could hear distinctly two voices. He said that it sounded like people having a conversation, though the voices were too low to be able to make out exactly what they were saying. He was alone in the house at the time. When Pop was at the house with the attorney, the attorney heard the door open and close and the sound of someone walking in the house with a cane. Mrs. Shipley used a cane. The lawyer told Pop someone was in the house, but a search turned up no one. They were in the house alone. Pop told the lawyer, that's just Mrs. Shipley. She was dead at the time, in case you're wondering. There was also a woman by the name of Armida that used to stay at the house. She lived in the city, but would sometimes come to stay there. My dad said that she would stay in what used to be the slave quarters there on the property. One day she saw Mr. Shipley walk down the hallway and into a room. Mr. Shipley had been dead for some time when she saw him. In addition to these stories, my dad said that chairs in the house would also move on their own without any kind of wind or draft to explain it. My family seems to be a magnet for weird. I guess that doesn't seem so surprising really with some of the things I've already mentioned here in the podcast. My cousin Kelly and I have encountered a number of strange things. And I mean, we go out in search of it. So it's not really surprising that we have encountered it. But some of those things that we've come across happen in our grandmother's house. I actually lived in the house until the summer before my freshman year in high school. My brother, sister, parents, and I all lived there with my grandmother. When I was five, before my siblings were born, my grandfather passed away in the upstairs bedroom he shared with my grandmother. When my brother and sister came along, there was a need to add one to the house. So there was a bedroom and a bathroom added to the upstairs, and my grandmother's room was enlarged. The added upstairs bedroom became my bedroom. When Kelly would come visit, we would spend a lot of time hanging out in the upstairs area. There was one time that we were recording our own news show. Now, we're talking middle school age. Kelly and I were in middle school. I think I was about 12. My sister would have been about 7-ish. And my brother would have been around the age of 4. That's going to be my guess. So we were recording this news show. I was the anchor, Connie Dung which was a play on Connie Chung, who was a popular news person at the time. Kelly was the cameraman, and my sister, dressed in her Fievel Mouskowitz American Tail nightgown, was in charge of the commercials. You're welcome, Carrie. I hope your friends are listening. It was pink, by the way. My brother, who was the youngest, was not in charge of anything because he was a brat. So I'm sitting on the bed. Kelly is across from me recording from a chair, and my sister is standing in front of me, doing her little spiel about buying toothpaste. And then my brother burst in the room yelling, big boobies, big boobies, big boobies. And I told you he was a complete brat. So he comes running in the room yelling, big boobies, big boobies. And he stops dead in front of us and says, who is that looking at me? The area that he's indicating is empty, though I knew personally that it was the area where my grandfather's recliner used to be located the one that he was in when he had his fatal heart attack. I know because I actually witnessed it. There was no one there at all. There there wasn't even a chair there. There was, I think, a small wooden table that had some plants on it. My grandmother was big in houseplants. She had a lot of houseplants. So that was all that was sitting there. He came running in from the bedroom door. The bed would have been to his left. Kelly was sitting in a chair to his right and directly ahead of him where he saw somebody staring at him was nothing more than a table full of houseplants. The video of this still exists, I believe. I think Kelly still has it on VHS. It's no one's ever going to see it. I'm sorry. So the stories about my grandmother's upstairs room don't end there. They just kind of start there. As I mentioned, the summer before my freshman year, my parents, siblings, and I moved about an hour away. My grandmother moved from her upstairs room to the bedroom downstairs. The upstairs bedroom was left for use by guests. My grandmother mentioned a time or two that she had heard some footsteps up there walking from the doorway across to the area where the chair used to be. And I mean the recliner that my grandfather used to use. She used to just say, oh, it's your grandfather. It's nothing to be afraid of. Some years later, 
when I was starting to become really big into paranormal investigation, my brother and I took a trip to my grandmother's house and decided to attempt an EVP session upstairs in the bedroom. While we were there, the doorknob on the door rattled as though someone was trying to open the door, though there wasn't anybody upstairs with us at the time. Sometime after this, Kelly was visiting, and she and I and my brother were sleeping in the upstairs room, on purpose, because it's haunted. Of course, we decided a little investigating was in order, so we tried an EVP session. One of the EVPs where we asked if the spirits knew who we were answered with what sounded like Jamie and Aaron. Aaron is my brother. Around that time, the door into the bedroom opened by itself. There was no one else there, no one was upstairs, and the way the rooms are designed, there was no way anyone could be hiding. So the way the the bedrooms are is from downstairs, you open the door to walk upstairs, and the staircase is enclosed. You walk upstairs, you go to the right, you immediately enter what used to be my old bedroom. You have to walk through my bedroom, into the hall, the bathroom is there on the left, and my grandmother's bedroom, the haunted bedroom, would be straight ahead. I didn't have a whole lot of privacy up there. My grandmother and I used to kind of joke that we were roommates because she would have to walk through my bedroom to get to her room. And if she left her room to go to the bathroom, I could hear her because there was no door there. So there's really no place for somebody to, to go. There, there's no place for anybody to hurry up and run to to hide. The only other people in the house at the time were my grandmother and my Aunt Patsy, neither of whom are going to run anywhere to go hide because they could fall down the steps, trip, whatever, and we would hear them. So there was nobody upstairs when that door opened. It's late. We've been doing EVPs, scaring ourselves. The bedroom door opens by itself. We're freaked out. And about that time is when we start hearing the knocking noise on the wall. The wall where we heard the knocking coming from has no pipes in it at all. The bathrooms are in the center of the house, and this wall is an exterior wall. Also, the kitchen is in the front opposite corner from this room, so there's no pipes at all in this wall. There's no way that there's any pipes there. There was also nothing on the exterior of the house that would cause noise. No tree near the house, no loose siding, there's no shutters in that area. Nothing obvious that would explain a knocking noise. I checked. That's something you do with the paranormal. You want to find the logical explanation. Logical explanation for knocking in the wall? Pipes? Something banging on the outside of the house? We did not have any kind of rodent problem at all. So we had no obvious explanation for this. So we hear the knocking. And the knocking actually sounded like it came more from the inside of the room than it than from the outside. So it actually sounded more like knocking on the interior wall. And because, I don't know, we're weird, we decided it would be an excellent idea to start asking questions. So we start asking yes and no questions, and the knocking would answer. I can't remember exactly what we asked, but I know we indicated that whatever it was needed to knock once for yes, twice for no, or something along those lines. So when the knocking started to be intelligent and answer questions, we all decided that we should just go sleep downstairs in the living room. With no mattresses or blankets, it was a pretty uncomfortable night. So fast forward a couple years, Kelly and I and her mom, my Aunt Patsy, were investigating a local mental hospital late at night. This mental hospital is in the same town that my grandmother lived in. We were staying at her house. So we're at this mental hospital late at night. We returned to my grandmother's house where we were staying and Kelly and I decided we were under no circumstances sleeping upstairs in the haunted room. So we drag the mattresses off the beds and haul them downstairs to the living room. The next morning, my grandmother was not very happy to find that we had pulled all the mattresses downstairs and had set up a little homeless camp in her living room. And my aunt, she was kind of like, you guys will go investigate a haunted mental hospital late at night in an unsafe area known for crime, but you won't sleep upstairs in your grandmother's house. And we said, yeah, that's that's basically it. That's 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 the truth. Since my grandmother passed, the house has been sold. I have no idea if the new owners 
have any kind of experiences. I can't imagine that things stopped. Who knows? No idea. So this next set of stories comes from one of our listeners that I'm going to refer to as John. These are all little short stories and they all point to one conclusion. And that's basically that John and members of his family seem to be sensitive to the spirits around them. John said that on one occasion, he heard his aunt's voice call out her name three separate times while he was in his home. The odd part about that was that his aunt was actually visiting her daughter at the time in a completely different state. And at the same time, she was dying from a massive stroke. John goes on to say that when his mother passed away, his grandmother ended up passing away only about two weeks later. Just prior to his grandmother's passing, all of her children were gathered there at her bedside in her last moments. His grandmother questioned where John's mother was. No one had told her that she had passed away two weeks before. His grandmother said, I hear her calling me, but I don't see her. Where is she? I remember personally when my grandmother was nearing the end of her life, she was receiving hospice care and she was seeing people who no one else could see. The hospice nurse actually said this was not an uncommon event for people who were nearing the end. But back to John's experiences. I think even though John wants to remain anonymous, it's safe to say that he is in the medical profession. I don't want to go into more detail than that because he wishes to remain anonymous. But because of descriptions of things, you're going to figure it out anyway. So he is in the medical field. And one day while John is at work, he saw a small framed woman standing in a corner. As he looked up at her, She drifted up into the air and disappeared. Moments later, he received a phone call saying that the woman had died. Another time while he was working on a patient, he noticed in the operatory next to him, he saw a man in a chair. John said he recognized the shoes that the man was wearing because he had a patient that always wore the same kind of shoes. Later, he learned that around the same time he saw the man in the operatory, His patient was T-boned in a car accident and died. John also shared a story about a premonition that he had. One day, he was getting into his dad's car. He was getting into the driver's side and had to reach across to unlock the passenger door for his brother. This was before the automatic door locks. As he did this, he saw the word accident flash on the floor of the passenger seat. He mentioned this to his brother, but his brother just brushed it off. They drove for about an hour when John told his brother they needed to stop, and as John pulled over onto the shoulder, one of the car's tires blew into shreds. There's a couple of stories that John sent that also include his wife. On one occasion, when they were visiting John's grandparents, his wife saw a man in the corner looking out the window. John later showed her a photo of his great-grandfather, and his wife realized that this was the man that she had seen. John didn't mention it in his email, but I'm assuming here that his great-grandfather was no longer living at the time. The house that John grew up in was a combination home and office, and often he would feel a force, for lack of a better word, pushing him as he walked from office to house. He never mentioned it to his wife until one day she described having the same exact feeling. I know that I've done that myself where I've heard or I've felt something and I've said nothing. Though in my case, it's usually so I wasn't swaying somebody's opinion or perception because I wanted to see if they were having the same experience, usually during an investigation. John also shared that there was a strange occurrence with the computers in his office. All the computers were on a separate electric circuit, and that was unplugged every night. His wife entered the office and saw a green glow one night coming from a monitor but the computers had been unplugged for at least 48 hours. This next story from John involves his infant son. John wrote that his son had a high fever. He and his wife were taking turns checking on him every hour. It was around 3 a.m. when it was John's turn to get up to check the baby. He entered the room and saw his mother hovering over the infant. His mother had died six months previously. In the morning, His son was fine and the fever had broken. And the last story that I'm going to share with you from John 
is about something that is referred to as a phantom hitchhiker. John said that on a main highway between two towns where he lived was a known hitchhiker. The legend said that if you stop to pick up this hitchhiker, he always wants you to drop him off at a specific house. The house is one the man used to live in at the time of his death. He was killed in an auto accident in the location where he appears looking for a ride. Sometimes the hitchhiker will just appear in your car when you pass the area and disappear when you pass his old home. This is what happened to John. The hitchhiker appeared in the back seat of his car, and when he looked back, he was gone. And that's going to tie us in with another story from Kelly about a phantom hitchhiker. This was what she sent me. My dad and I were driving from Parkersburg to Eglon, West Virginia on Route 50. When you get up into the mountains, there are some pretty bad dead man's curves. There was still enough light to see, but it was a cold, dreary, rainy evening. We had gone around a particularly bad blind curve and saw a woman standing by the side of the road. She looked like she was dazed. Her eyes looked black, like two black holes. Her mouth was open and she was just staring out into the distance as if she was in a trance. She looked dirty and drenched from the rain. My dad and I both saw her as we drove by. We were up the road no more than 15 yards or so and had slowed down to see if she needed help. We looked back and she was gone. There were a few houses around so we thought maybe she lived there. We were both creeped out by it. Even my dad, who was never afraid of anything. It was the sort of thing that gives you chills and makes your skin crawl. The next day, my dad told one of the old timers who lived on the mountain what, he, what we saw. He didn't seem surprised. He told us matter of factly that it's the ghost of a young woman who was hit by a car and killed a long time ago. He said many people traveling on that road still see her on cold rainy evenings, always standing there at the curve, staring off into nowhere. Kelly actually has a ton of really great ghost stories. I'm really hoping that I can talk her into sharing them on the podcast one day. For now, I'm going to share one more story, one about the house that she grew up in. And I'm sharing this one because I actually witnessed it. I was there. So Kelly lived in an old farmhouse in West Virginia as a kid. It was a few hours away from where I lived, and I visited there many times. The place was kind of unnerving for lack of a better word. Personally, I always kind of felt uncomfortable in the upstairs part of the house, which was also sort of the main level of the house. If I remember correctly, you would come in from the front door, you would walk into the main level, and that had the bedrooms and like a large, kind of like a parlor area. And then downstairs was the kitchen and a family room. And you could walk out downstairs. It was kind of on a hill, sort of. It's been a very long time since I've been there, but that's kind of how I remember it. She'll correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, it was the downstairs area that I personally was most comfortable in, except for this one room. Super creepy room. I never even saw the inside of that room. You just didn't go in that room. So based on my kid kids memory my childhood memory the downstairs was slightly more comfortable for me personally than the upstairs anyway one time the family all went out to visit kelly and her parents and her mom was getting the air mattresses ready and you used to be able to use a vacuum cleaner in reverse to inflate things like air mattresses i don't even know if they still do that my vacuum doesn't i think the shop vac can do it but you you don't put it in reverse you just switch the hose around and it'll inflate things but this was just a regular canister vacuum cleaner so Aunt Patsy has the mattress there she gets the hose of the vacuum cleaner and she says something like go ahead and turn it on and the vacuum cleaner turns on only no one was near the vacuum cleaner and no one had turned it on that's actually mild compared to some of the stories that come from Kelly's childhood home. I'm really fingers crossed hoping that I can talk her into coming on here and sharing those with us because they're great. They're really awesome. Super creepy. 
So our final story is going to come from my own home. If you've listened to the podcast from the beginning, you already know that my house is haunted. It's at least 140 years old, possibly older, and we've had a lot of strange things go on here. You can listen to episode 11 if you'd like some background on the spooky things that have gone on here in the house. I'm actually going to talk about something that I mentioned in that episode as it plays into the story that I'm going to share. Recently in episode 36, there were some strange noises recorded while I was recording the episode, and I included an EVP session in that episode near the end, in case you're interested. I'm going to mention that as well. So, episode 11 tells you the all the stuff that's happened at my house up until June of this year, and then episode 36, which I think was the Bennington Monster, that has an EVP that I just recorded recently. Episode 11 also includes some EVP if you're interested and you haven't listened yet, or you want to refresh your memory. So my Aunt Patsy passed away in June of 2020. December of 2020 comes around, and I'm faced with the daunting task of prepping for Christmas. I don't think I was alone in not really feeling like Christmas in 2020. I think everybody, for one reason or another, kind of was fed up and it was difficult to muster the Christmas spirit. Everybody struggled in 2020. I don't think 2021 was really a whole heck of a lot better, to be honest with you. But 2020 was rough. Prepping for Christmas at my house is a huge undertaking. I have somewhere around 13 or more plastic storage bins full of Christmas items. Plus there's other stuff like wreaths and Santa Claus musical things and stuff that aren't even in boxes that I have to carry down by the arm load. I had managed at this time to get all of the bins carried out of the attic and onto the main floor of the house. I had them all stacked up in the hallway, about three bins high, roughly. Bing Crosby was playing. I am a fan of classic Christmas songs and I don't really care for the newer stuff. I'm pretty sure the song All I Want For Christmas Is You makes my brain bleed, but that really isn't important. So I'm in my dining room putting a decoration wherever it belongs and I walk from the dining room into my kitchen and turn to the left to go to the hallway to get more decorations. And there in the hallway, standing, looking in my bins, is a figure. The figure was blurry, kind of translucent, though I could see colors and make out clothing. I, it was a person. Without a doubt, it was a person. It's like if you have really bad eyesight and you take your glasses off and you're looking at something without your glasses, that's how I would explain it. Very blurry, no sharp features or lines at all. I could tell the height. The height was about my height, so around, I'm about five foot three inches, and give or take. I wasn't close enough to really measure it, but it was close to my height. The hair was shorter and was kind of a graying light brown color, for lack of a better term. And the top, the shirt was white, the pants were a darker blue. I... I, I I have to pause because I actually, I got chills. I I can still see this in my head. I had to take a minute here because it actually uh, upset me a little bit just now. So I was pretty shook up upon seeing it. As I said, we've had some weird encounters here in the house, but we've never actually had a full-bodied apparition show up. So I see this figure, take it in, and immediately duck back into the dining room. I am messaging Kelly and Angelina immediately because I'm home alone and I'm freaked out a bit and I was overwhelmed. Emotionally overwhelmed is a good way to explain it. I go, I get up the nerve, I go back to look down the hallway and the figure is gone. 
I didn't see any more figures after that, but I did have some moments where I felt like someone was looking over my shoulder while I was working on the computer or recording a podcast. I mentioned all of that in episode 11. Fast forward to December 2021. I mentioned many times to Kelly and Angelina that I kind of wondered if I was going to have a visit from my Christmas ghost. While I was recording episode 36, The Bennington Monster, there were some strange knocking noises going on. I was able to catch it on recording for the episode. I left it in. And at the end of the episode, I did an EVP session and I was able to get some EVP as well. I had just recently brought some of the Christmas decoration boxes down from the attic at the time that I did that recording for that episode. It seemed like perhaps my Christmas ghost might be back. That bringing those decorations downstairs kind of triggered something. I forgot to mention that when the ghost showed up, I was decorating in preparation for a Christmas party. And this year I was prepping for a party with close family and friends as well. So we have some strange loud knocking noises happen and an EVP. I didn't do more than that because really there's only so much paranormal investigation that I want to do in my house while I'm alone or even when I'm not alone. I just the rule has always been you don't check out stuff in your own house where you live because you have to stay there. It's not like I can drag my mattress down to the living room it, it doesn't work like that. I can't go show up at my parents' house. I'm stuck here with whatever's here. So I don't always want to know exactly what's here. I do EVPs and take EVPs really for this podcast for you guys to listen to. So you're welcome. I'm terrifying myself for your benefit. A week after the knocking noise happens, it's the morning of the day of the party. My husband and son have left the house for a scouting activity. I am getting ready to leave the house to run a couple of errands. I go outside the front door, I close the door, and as I'm still standing there, I can hear the dining room chairs being moved across the floor. I immediately assume it's the dog or the cat or both, but I can see both of them sitting by the front door through the window. So the front door... Half of the door has windows on it. It's, a, it's an older door. So I can see the dog. She's sitting right there looking up at me, wondering what the heck I'm doing. And the cat is sitting there in the hopes that I'm going to open the door back up and he's going to be able to shoot out the door and, and run away. And while I'm standing there looking at them, I hear the noise again. And this time while I'm watching... The dog turns her head and looks back towards the dining room because she hears the noise too. You can't see the dining room from the door, unfortunately, but there was no doubt something was moving the chairs and it wasn't anyone in the house and it wasn't any animal in the house and it wasn't any living thing. So that night, party's happening. Kelly's there. Angelina and her husband and her daughter are there. I'm making my rounds and I finally meet up with them out in the backyard. It actually, temperature wise, wasn't too bad. It was actually this past Saturday. So the 18th, this is when this happened. It actually wasn't bad outside. So they were outside. Kelly had had her dog there. The dogs were, you know, doing their thing. So we're in the backyard and I find out that there's some more weird woo-woo stuff going on. Kelly mentioned to them that she had felt her mom's presence. That would be Aunt Patsy. And Angelina's daughter feels two distinct taps on her shoulder. I then admit that all along, I thought perhaps the apparition that I saw last year was Aunt Patsy. I had actually received some of Aunt Patsy's Christmas decorations after her passing. And she was big into decorating for the holidays. Not just Christmas, but every holiday. She had things for every single holiday, I think. She always came to my Christmas parties. I've had them every year. I I actually did not have it in 2020 because of COVID. She always came to my Christmas parties. And it seems like perhaps she's still making sure that she's there. And with that, I want to leave everybody with what I hope might be a comforting thought for some, some of you. 
like in my story of my Christmas ghost and John's story of his mother being there when his son, her grandson, was sick, your loved ones may not be there in the physical sense, but they are always with you and they are always aware of what you're doing in your life. So I hope that might bring someone comfort. That's going to do it for this episode. I hope everyone has a happy and healthy holiday. If you have a story or experience you want to share, please send it to us at lurkpodcast at yahoo.com. As always, you can find Lurk wherever you listen to your favorite podcast or at lurkpodcast.com. On the website, you can also find links to our social media platforms where we share photos from episodes, funny stuff, events, and any other relevant or irrelevant information. We also have merchandise you can find at lurkpodcastmerch.com. Until next time, keep lurking.